Um, all right. Well, with that, I want to um, get started with our speakers today. We're really lucky to have um, um, Dan Dolgen from Eaton Hemp with us today. He's um, over in New York and working on building, I'm continuing to build. I've been working with Dan for quite some time now. He was one of the first, I think you were the first registered grower in New York, actually. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I had to live through that. Um, and we, I remember swapping some war stories with him on that first year and um, has built quite a business um, focused around um, grain in particular, but also fiber and CBD too. So we'll be hearing from him. Um, and Willie Gibson, who is a crop consultant, but Willie has served in many roles um, throughout the Northeast. He's worked with Extension. He's worked with NOFA Vermont. Um, he's worked in hemp for a number of years now. Now he works for Northeast Ag Sales. He's a crop consultant um, working in hemp. And so we'll hear from him also. Um, but to start with, we're going to hear from Sam Bellavance and Cy Cooper Smith from Sunset Lake CBD. And they're in Alberg, or their um, hemp farm is located in Alberg. I think they're joining us today from the Burlington area. And um, they're going to start us off talking about their hemp business. Um, and then uh, they'll have a few minutes for questions for them. And then we'll move on to Dan, same thing. Um, and a few minutes of questions for him, then to Willie. Um, and then we'll wrap up hopefully with enough time to ask additional questions if folks have them. All right, so Sam and Sai, I'm gonna let you basically introduce yourselves and your business. Um, cool. And you have 10 minutes. All right. Um... Yeah, so we've got our, our screen going here. My name is Sam, and this is uh, my business partner, Sai. Hi, everybody. So, um, cool. So a little background on us. Uh, started as a dairy farm. My family uh, owns Sunset Lake Farm. We're Ben and Jerry's Caring Dairy. And I got started uh, growing hemp for grain in 2019 on some of our dairy land. Uh, it didn't work out, and uh, and then in um, started doing uh, CBD plants uh, the following year, and have actually grown fewer and fewer plants each year, but I've had uh, more and more luck in the industry. So we'll kind of get into that dynamic uh, as we go on. So just kind of some less some lessons learned. Uh, you know, we've found success, but a lot of, a lot of folks have been burned. Uh, hemp farming is more of a specialty crop. Um, you know, we hand, you know, we check for males by hand, everything's hand harvested, everything's hand bucked. Uh, it's very labor intensive. It's not just like going out there with a corn combine and, and, uh, you know, packing silage or, you know, I've seen some people, uh, combine their hemp and wet bale it. And we, you know, and then extract from there. We weren't really into that. Um, more plants doesn't necessarily mean more money, you know, with, uh, plants getting seeded down, you, they're, they're just because you economize and scale up, you know, we found success kind of in that 10 to 15 acre range. We weren't trying to be that hundred acre farm with a huge team and just, it, it, it wasn't what we were trying to do. And, you know, we, uh, we focused on just like very general farm management, you know, cost controls, having a really good team, well, really well trained team you know, soil and plant health, you know, we worked with, uh, you know, Heather and, and John Bruce at the extension school. We were really lucky that they were in Alberg with us. And um, this, no one, you know, this isn't four years ago. No one's going to back a truck onto your farm just to, to buy biomass. Um, you're you're going to have to put in the legwork. And if you're going to make, you know, concentrates, you're going to have to find some value added products. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Cool. Uh, just so, some lessons we learned uh, about growing hemp. Uh, you know, the sandy loam that we have in Alberg is really great for getting those big plants. You know, those denser clays can be really difficult for getting the roots, uh, the necessary air and the right pH balance. Um, mainly using a rototiller and not the big harrows. Uh, so kind of different equipment sets and dairy farming. And then the last thing is just giving plenty of space. Our average plant is about six feet tall and you know seven to eight feet wide. 
So this, these two photos are taken at the same exact place. Um, so this was our first year and we did not give enough space between the rows. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure you've got plenty of space. And so when we get into actual like field management, some things we've learned, uh, and I'm sure this has gone over in some of the earlier presentations, but we can definitely confirm that European corn borer aphids are the two biggest pests we're seeing. Um, the top fungus are the powdery mildew, botrytis, leaf sephoria. Um, there's some powdery mildew on the right. Uh, we've seen those uh, really wipe out large sections of crops. Um, mm. The hemp seems to do a lot much better at fighting pests than fungus in our experience. Mm. Um, the predatory insects are great. And uh, yeah, I'd say don't, don't wait too long to harvest your crop because you might lose it if it, if it gets hit hard. So kind of marketing the crop. So I handle most of our sales uh, for Sunset Lake, the wholesale especially. We do a lot of trim flower business. Uh, it's your highest value product, um, you know, beyond like processing and selling in, in like a tincture form. But like the costs are very high. Um, there are very high expectations within the market, you know, very picky customers. Uh, you can't have mold. It's got to smell nice. It's got to be high CBD. It's got to smoke well. Uh, biomass is only as good as, you know, you're going to have to make it into a concentrate and you're going to have to put it in a tincture or gummies or salve or whatever. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of farmers sitting around with a 2019 crop that they'd be happy to sell their biomass for a, for a dollar, a dollar a pound right now, you know, four or five years ago, you could have gotten $70, $80 a pound, but those, those days are gone. You know, things have scaled and it's commoditized Bi biomass is essentially a commodity. And, uh, you know, similar with the oil, you know, you've got labs that will, you know, if you put it into tinctures, you know, a, a liter of crude can make you, you know, a couple grand, but if, you know, there are labs that will sell, you know, certified organic 75% CBD crude for $250 a liter, which, you know, for smaller farm, you know, that if they're buying it in Kentucky or Colorado, you know, those farm, those places can, can really get those, those prices down. I don't think Vermont is quite there. Um, so, uh, if you want the most value out of your crop, you, you gotta, you gotta do product development. You gotta do graphic design. You gotta have good photography. You have to get it in people's hands. You have to convince, you have to be price competitive. Um, you know, doing all the other regular business stuff, you, you know, uh, other folks would touch on this too. You, you gotta have a nice, you gotta have a nice looking website. You gotta get the processing. You gotta get your shipping competencies. You gotta get your warehousing. You gotta have quality control. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, I'd say some, you know, growing hemp is about 10% of the battle and, and the rest of it just comes with, you know, everything else. Cool. Yeah. So just, uh, Final piece of advice for us is to kind of figure out what your lane in the market is, whether that's farming, uh, whether it's graphic design, whether it's, uh, you know, selling supplies and materials to farming, uh, whether it's fiber, are you a pet food brand, are you a, a human health brand, and really stick to that and try and specialize. Um, and then try and take advantage of what skills you already have. You know, we were coming into this, uh, you know, with a dairy farm. So the farming made sense for us. If you don't have a farming background, it might not make sense for you. And you might be able to use your skills uh, to still work in the hemp industry, but maybe from a different angle. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing is just focus on the quality uh, because, you know, Vermont, we're not we're a pretty small state where we are and we're not going to compete at scale um, with very, very large farms. So we're always focusing on quality over quantity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all we've got. And if you have questions, um, feel free to ask away. And I also have our emails there if you want to contact us. Great. Thank you. Excellent. You stayed right on time. <laughs> Perfect. And the, like we yeah, and the the questions are rolling in, so we'll get um we'll ask as many as we can um before it's uh, Dan's turn. So 
the first question is, um, do you use any of the extra fiber from the hemp to feed your animals? Um, we have talked to our nutritionist for the dairy on that. And it's something where it, they could work it into the, um, basically into the food rationing, but it would be at a very, very small percentage. Yeah. You couldn't just feed a cow pure hemp. Um, it's just, it's so high in protein and we've actually had cows get loose in our hemp field and they don't eat it. No. Um, they want nothing to do with eating the hemp plant. Uh, so from our experience, we, we don't feed it to the animals. Um, but we're certainly open to that and maybe yeah. in the future we will. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is, how are the little guys in Vermont saving money on shipping? It's gotten expensive. Um, well, we ship everything through USPS. Um, we have our shipping software is called Shippo. I think we're switching over fairly soon. Um, it's not, I mean, it sucks to pay for shipping, but like that's, People seem to be fine with paying it, you know, anything over 75 bucks. Like we, we, we cover shipping and other than that, it's like five or 10 bucks. And that, that seems to work out fine. All right. Um, let's see your thoughts on New York state law regarding smokable hemp. Yeah. Um, we, so our lawyers are, we use the Vermont cannabis solutions and uh new york has banned i guess lot like in a regulatory sense has banned the sale of smokable hemp but boots on the ground um says there's not a ton of enforcement going on we don't i don't have a ton of in there sam if you uh because i've been working on that bill and and, and against and on those regulations i could do that during yeah, sure, it might yeah. be better for it's Dan. Better to, I'm yeah. sure Dan has a lot more knowledge on that than we do. <laughs> so maybe save that question for him. All right. Yeah, we, we will do that. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you Dan. Uh, um, do you have any intent to expand into fiber or grain? And what uh -oh. happened to the crop that didn't work out, Sam? Uh. Yeah. So <laughs> what happened is, honestly, it grew great. Yeah. The, the problem is I had a contract to sell it and the um other party did not want to buy the grain um so that was the issue the is line. really getting that marketing it, is there like you can grow something as a farmer but if there isn't that market and if you don't have those relationships it's really hard to get value yeah. out of it um if we had a market for growing grain or growing fiber we would certainly do it um so that's kind of the the answer there. Okay. Um, how is your outlook on Delta eight? It's, it's the wild west right now. Uh, if the DEA scheduled it tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, we don't sell any of it. And, um, a lot of the Delta eight products that you see on the market are, are probably just marijuana. Um, they're, you know, if for people who don't know, Delta-8 is a, is, a, is a lawful THC isomer that is intoxicating. And if it's derived from a hemp concentrate, it's fine. If it's derived from a marijuana concentrate, it is illegal. Uh, a lot of this, it's just totally the Wild West. Like if you, I, I would suspect most Delta-8 products are just marijuana. Um, I don't see it staying around for that long. And I, there was something in the chat um, that the DEA did schedule it, but it sounds like you just kind of clarified that a little bit, Sai, saying if it comes from one source, it's illegal. From another, it may be sort yeah. of legal. <laughs> it, it's not a good fit for our brand yeah. at this time. You know, if other farmers are doing it legally and successfully, then that's right. awesome for them. It's just not a good fit for us at this moment. Yeah. Good. Perfect answer. Um, one last question, and then we'll turn it over to Dan. Um, would you consider animals for weed control? You know, so some people will put maybe sheep out in the field to, or geese even, you know, to 
eat the weeds? Um, yeah, we would try that. I don't, I don't have any sheep on hand. Um, if someone's willing to lend us some sheep, sure, we could, we could fence off a little area and give it a try. Yeah, that's been um, pretty popular in um, hops in particular. You know, there's been, uh, that's been done. And, and other crops too, geese. Um, I think sometimes it's a food safety issue, yeah. um, but who, who knows, always maybe worth a try. Um, any, if there's any other questions, we have an, one more minute. And um, I, I did see um, a comment in the chat also about the USDA does not currently allow for hemp silage to be fed for livestock, which is, is um, true. There's a lot of work going on right now with uh, different feed associations to try to figure out where um, hemp fits um, in the livestock industry. Now, certainly there are other meals, oil seed meals fed um, to livestock like soybean meal, um, canola meal. And so especially from the seed grain perspective, there's a lot of interest in feeding hemp seed meal um, to animals to increase, you know, omega threes and beneficial fats and such in yeah. those products. So, um, Heather, if, yeah. one, if you don't mind, one thing that, that the hemp does play really well with the dairy farm, especially in terms of nutrient management, yeah. because it is such a high feeder, we're able to, uh, you know, put a lot of manure on our hemp field and help, uh, you know, control our nutrient management that way. Yeah. That's so a really does, great point. Help the dairy there. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Very good point. It is a, a needy crop. And I think um, Willie might, he's made a few comments over the weeks about um, high fertility fields and people still like putting fertilizer on, you know, and yeah. causing some issues with yeah, uh, maturity and things like that. So it's good. Um, I know we've worked a lot together trying to figure out how to manage um all the nutrients you already have and we we even did a few psnt tests on on your farm not last year the year before mm -hmm. and just saw how you know like there's plenty of nitrogen there you guys don't need that anymore so i think it is true it's it it's a good pairing as long as you know how to use that fertility benefit yeah. <laughs> for sure yeah okay oh all right you're off the hook for now dan so right. dan i'm gonna let you take it from here Okay, you guys can see this, I hope? Yep. All right, great. Um, so just a little history of kind of how we got here. So uh, this is myself, my, my partners, Mark and Lydia, and this is us planting literally the first seed in uh, New York soil uh, in over 80 years, um, first legal seed at least. And so this is back in 2016. Um, so just by way of, uh, you know, background, our farm is uh, JD Farms and our brand is Eaton Hemp. Um, uh, our farm, uh, existed well before, um, we had a, uh, you know, a hemp license. We're one of the largest organic hay producers in the state. Um, now we're one, uh, we also run a, a very large grass fed organic dairy operation, um, as well. Um, so to kind of Sam and size point, I think, uh, hemp fits very well in, in an ecosystem, um, by standalone, um, you really have to kind of dial in and know exactly what you're what you're doing with it. Um, our interest initially, because we're an organic farm, was with hemp as a cover crop because it grows fast and has broad leaves that can crowd out weeds. Um, we did what I recommend nobody does and what I speak a lot about is we planted before knowing exactly what we were going to do with the crop that we harvested. Um, like I said, we were interested in its potential as a cover crop. But at that point, this is before CBD was kind of a household name. We weren't growing for CBD or for, you know, uh, we were growing more uh, for grain, uh, potentially for fiber. And we figured we'd kind of uh, follow along and, and see what would happen. Now, as the market is developed and hemp is, is legal, I think knowing exactly what you want to do with your crop before it goes into the ground is vital, whether you want to be a producer and just sell it to a brand or to a processor or whether you want to be vertically integrated and start your own brand is something very important to, to understand and know all the economics of. Um, if I, let me see if this works. Oop. 
there you go. Uh, so <laughs> this is also the first year uh, because of the DEA import permit, um, we had to have a armed guard uh, with us as we planted the seeds. So I just thought this was kind of a, always an interesting picture to share to show just how far we've come in terms of uh, legalization and regulation. Um, we plant it, like I said, for, for grain uh, and for fiber, just the way you would do other crops, um, uh, similar crops, corn, soy, and wheat. Um, we, you know, plow, disc, um, till. You can do no-till because we're a grass farm. Uh, we, we tend to need to plow. Um, it, is, it does work very well in rotation. Uh, one thing we've learned is you don't want to plant uh, hemp in the same field year, year after year. Um, I think you want to kind of cycle through and maybe give it about four years between, uh, between hemp growing. Um, that's particular for grain. I'm not sure for CBD, you can do in the same, in the same, uh, in the, in the same field. The way we think about CBD versus kind of grain and fiber is, um, and I think Sam and Sai also touched on this is, is CBD is more like horticulture. And I would say grain fiber, are like agriculture. Um, in the sense that horticulture needing to, it's plant by plant, you know, you really have to pay attention to spacing. Whereas when you're growing for grain or fiber, you know, we're doing 28 to 30 pounds um, per acre. We're using the same traditional planters and combines and harvest uh, equipment to, uh, to, um, to grow the crop. Um, so this is our John Deere planter we were using to plant seeds with. Um, interestingly enough, it had a hemp setting uh, because a lot of these come from Europe where hemp uh, has a, a long history and wasn't um, uh, illegal the way it was here. So um, that was very useful. Um, this is the seed actually you know, in, the, uh, in the planter itself. Um, and that's us loading into. Uh, so it, it does grow very fast. Um, this is probably four or five days after, um, after planting. So you could start seeing it, it does poke through. The initial two weeks of after planting are probably the most important in the life of, of, um, of hemp um, because it really needs to take a stand and it needs about an inch of water a week. And you know, the conditions really need to be right. So, so before you plant kind of knowing that window, um, it's, more important to have a window of weather than it is to sort of do it by an actual date. We've planted as late as July, you know, 12th, 13th, 14th, and still had a very good crop. Um, whereas opposed to sometimes we planted early June and we've just had a deluge of kind of late spring rain and got flooded out and, and in some cases had to replant. Um, so this is just it coming up through the field. Um, this is probably, I would say, eight or nine days. Uh, you see some good growth there. Um, you can start to see it row up. Similar here, this is probably like uh, now around the kind of two week mark. You can see it really starting to pop through. Um, we initially that first year had a, uh, had a drought and we invested in these big water guns. Um, a lot of uh, farmers, especially out west, have moved to pivots and they're selling these giant, um, uh, you know, water, water, you know, above ground water sprayers. And this really helped us. Um, if you have natural, you know, spring water on the farm, you know, it's, it's really good to have these just in case. Um, we haven't really needed to use them since that first year. Um, but uh, you don't want to, hemp can survive a lot of things. It's probably survives a drought better than a flood. But if you start getting, you know, three, four weeks with no rain, you're going to want to pull out, pull out the guns. Um, this is probably, uh, say this is about uh, a month into it. So you could start to see the males and females are starting to kind of distinguish themselves um, for, I don't know if you guys had covered this, but the males are the kind of tall, taller ones. You can kind of see they have the seed sacks on it and the, and the females are, are smaller and have kind of the more of the dense leaves and, and, and buds. Um, and then uh, this is a great example of, of a male plant. You can see our water gun there in the background. Um, so this is uh, probably about three weeks away from pollination. And then this is after it's been pollinated and you could see the male plants, which are the, the kind of brown, which are starting to die out. And, uh, and the, the, green, the, the rich green ones are the females, which are now producing buds and seeds. So what, 
like I said, the first year, we didn't really know what we were going to do with it. And we started tasting the seeds from the plants and found that they were extremely delicious and crunchy. And we sort of knew what hemp parts were, but we hadn't really tasted a whole seed. And so we decided that our main focus was going to be to build a, a hemp snack company to focus on the nutritional aspect of, of hemp and really play up the flavor of the hemp seed, which I think had had either a bad rap or people just didn't really know that actually it was delicious in terms of taste. And also it had, you know, probably the most complete plant protein on earth. It's uh, the only vegan alternative to fish oil is hemp seed oil, which is in the seed itself. It has the omega three to, um, to six uh, uh, ratio and in, in, a, in, a, in a three to one balance, which is, um, which is really not found in any other kind of plant protein. Um, here's another example, a close up picture of, of, the, of the female with the seeds there. Just, just for scales purpose, this is, um, this is we, we planted a kind of a hybrid, hybrid fiber seed crop. So, uh, you know, they do grow a little bit taller than traditional grain crops. Um, so this is, uh, I'm, uh, I'm six, six, no, I'm just kidding. So I'm, uh, I'm about 5'11". So that's, that's probably about seven or eight feet. Um, again, another example for scale there. Uh, I'll play this video. This is actually, uh, you know, one of our fiber fields. Uh, we planted um, a fiber crop this year in transition ground. Um, for those of you who are organic growers, you know it takes three years uh, to transfer from a conventional to organic ground. We buy up conventional and then need to transfer it. So when we do fiber crop, we like to grow in transition ground because A, um, it, grows, it grows really well uh, in, in those, uh, as, a, um, as a transition crop but also it, it helps, it's a phytoremediary plant. So it means it soaks up, you know, things that are in the soil and helps kind of purify the ground. They actually use hemp in Chernobyl to help purify the land there. And when they use it in oil spills and things like that. And we've been talking to the state about using hemp um, in a number of places for, um, you know, environmental cleanup sites and things like that. So just to give you a example here, you can see the fiber crops are, Grow pretty tall there. Stop that, and then, and then this is uh, combining. So um, you know, combining hemp is definitely a challenge uh, because it's such a strong natural fiber. It tends to wrap around the combine. We've we've had almost you know fires start because you have to stop. That it gets wound up so much that it causes friction. Um, you have to go in and cut cut out the fiber. Um, here's another example of us kind of using our combine across uh, for, uh, one of our large grain fields. Um, this is uh, us cleaning out uh, a lot of the, uh, the fiber and whatnot in the combine itself, which we had to stop about every uh, probably two or three laps to, uh, to do. And this is what you can find if you let it go too long, which is uh, you, you see that just crazy mat of fiber that um, can wrap around the axles there and you have to start cutting it out and it's just, it's a pain. Um, after you uh, uh, harvest the, for, at least for grain, um, we put it into a, a silage truck and then that has to go right into a hopper. You harvest it, um, it's probably about 28, 30% moisture and you got to get it down very quickly to eight to 10% especially if you're doing food grade material, um, it could really impact peroxide value, which is an indication of rancidity. Um, and you want, to, um, you want to get it dried down as quickly as possible. Um, this year as an experiment, because of the, what I showed you with the fiber uh, and using even just a sickle cell motor, um, uh, uh, you, you it really, it really does it, uh, you know, takes a tax on your, on your machinery. So thankfully we live in an Amish uh, community here and we actually worked with um, uh, one of them to actually just cut <laughs> old fashioned way. And this actually worked out great. We actually got a tremendous yield because they're, they're able to cut so low to the ground. So um, that actually worked out well. We'll probably continue to do that. Uh, just shows you that sometimes old fashioned techniques are, are the best techniques. Um, and then we also just bail up uh, the remaining stalks. And we use this for our fiber products to create uh, pet bedding. We do cat litter, we do mulch. Um, 
this is what uh, I, uh, uh, you know, row of, uh, of what's left after you, you harvest the fiber. And so what we do is we, we have our own uh, brand, uh, Eaton Hemp. And like I said, we, we consider ourselves a hemp portfolio company. So we make sure every part of the plant has a home. Um, so we do hemp parts, which are probably the most uh, down the fairway hemp food, which you find in most grocery stores. Um, and uh, those are the, you know, the, the, the inner hull of the, um, of the hemp seed without the outer shell and uh, really high in omegas and uh, antioxidants and things like that. Um, we also then use the seeds, we toast them. This is uh, at one of our food manufacturing facilities where we're toasting the seed and we do different kinds of flavorings and we create um, toasted seed snacks. You see here are two of, two of our flavors, maple cinnamon and a pink salt. Um, and now we're creating um, a, uh, what we're calling a super bite, which is our, our raw balls, which are rolled in hemp hearts and they have different flavorings. Uh, these are some of our packaging here. These are not out on the market yet, but will be in the next uh, month. And then on the fiber side, um, we have a whole process we built here uh, to kind of clean the fiber and grind it up. And we use that to create pet bedding. Um, so that's, uh, you know, kind of the full scope of what we're doing here. Um, I, I'm happy to pause for questions because I'm not sure what specifically you want me to drill down on, but I uh, just figured to give you the yeah. lot of what we're doing here. That's great. Thanks, Dan. That, that's awesome. There are a few questions that have come in and I think we'll, we'll take time for a few of them. Um, uh, did you see any hemp? Did you see hemp change your soil's water retention? So I think think that question is sort of like, did the hemp improve the soil um, water holding capacity? Um, not, well, hemp can be used to fight erosion um, just in general. Uh, we haven't seen any change in terms of um, kind of the, the soil makeup. I don't know if we've necessarily tested it to the extent that I could say uh, yes or no. One thing I'll, I'll add too is when we planted, we interceded with red clover which uh, by trial and error worked out very well. I think by the third year, we, we really figured out that red clover was great to help prevent, especially if you're growing organically, to help prevent uh, some weed control. And it is a nitrogen depletion crop. So, you know, what you plant afterwards makes a big, makes a big difference. If you're talking about soil health and things like that, you just want to consider that, you know, you do want to restore nitrogen to the, to the field, which is why you don't want to plant hemp in the same place twice when it comes to grain or fiber. Great. Um, what uh, planting rate are you using or seeding rate? Do you know off the top of your head and, um, and any varieties that you like? Yeah, so we're doing about 28 to uh, 30 pounds per acre. Um, on the fiber side, probably a little higher because um, they tend to grow taller. Uh, if you don't need that, that much space on the grain, you kind of want it to push out so you can maybe do you know, 25, 26 pounds. In terms of varieties, um, we get most of our seeds uh, from uh, Manitoba, from uh, H HGI HPS. And I think Sarah Mitchell, who's our seed dealer is on, is on this call. I think you texted me a little earlier from King Agra. So um, the varieties that we get through them are, are great and they work as a hybrid fiber and grain crop. Great. All right, well, I wanna um, leave time for Willie. We do have a few more questions, but I think we'll we'll answer those at the end. And just so we revisit it, Dan, this whole thing about smokable flour in New York. Yes, um, and, and there's some other questions about um, hemp seed oil. So just be thinking about that and we'll, we'll get back to those. And uh, Willie, do you wanna hop on and share some of your wisdom? Okay. Yeah, it's a little light. Can you speak okay. up? Yeah. If I just lean in here. Yeah, right there. Up. Lean right in. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Let me share. All right. Um, this is me. Um, this is about as busy as I, as far as a PowerPoint goes. I'm going to show you a couple of things, but I just give you a quick background. I grew up dairy farming in Vermont. Um, really, kind of had that dairy farm mentality right up until probably about 
the time I started with extension in 1988, um, I started working with farmers on, on dairy issues, but got pretty rapidly moved into the grass fed kind of dairy world, the grazing world, and that expanded nicely my horizon in terms of the kinds of livestock that we were working with, um, which, which was, uh, you know, and one of the nice things about being in Vermont is that as much as we're a dairy state, um, other livestock have a history here and they certainly have a lot of fit because not all, all of our ground is set up perfectly well for dairy cows. And um, that, that world of, of working with farmers that were interested in grazing in particular and kind of keeping away from the tillage and so on also became very interested in the concept of soil health, which at the time was more considered a soil quality word. You know, the NRCS kind of took on and wanted to make it much more quantitative. So they started working with what they called soil quality. Um, you know, all of this kind of stems off of certainly a lot of Rodale work and, and years earlier in the, in the real conservation days back in the 30s and 40s. Um, so it really piqued my interest to be focused on soil health, um, a lower kind of input type of farming. And it also made me be much more interested in what my mother tried to bring me up to understand, which was that nature has a way of functioning and we're part of it and we control it all. And if we try to, we're probably gonna break ourselves against it. So that mentality of, of looking at farming as being kind of cooperating and trying to be a partner with nature rather than, a, than an adversary has been kind of my mentality that I've tried to work with. So as a crop advisor, or as an, a farm advisor in general, um, my emphasis as much as anything has been on the people that are involved in the farming because the people are, are the factors that <clears throat> really can do something about themselves, quite honestly. And farm families, families in general, the community, I mean, ultimately it's the decisions we make that have the impacts that we're concerned about or the impacts that we're trying to, trying to Pulled together with, with a farm and, and you know traditionally farms in Vermont um, certainly in the Northeast probably anywhere else they're they're family oriented and having a family and a farm business at the same time um, either one of them is challenging enough so I got interested in being able to you know it kind of just came natural I guess was you know ask a lot of questions listen to a lot of answers, and then try to reflect back to the people that I'm working with, what I heard them saying, what I heard them being concerned about, and ultimately trying to fit that into their desire to make farming, you know, kind of the central element of their life or an important part of their life. So I ended up taking a course in 1993 called Holistic Resource Management, which was a wonderful aha for me. I spent a week out in Amish country in Ohio and got to spend time in the Amish community and also learning this management model at the time, which was called holistic resource management. I guess it's since been converted to just holistic management. And one of the things that it really helped me um, helped me do was, was fairly simply understand a, a system that I think in, in the farm business, business management classes I took in college, which I did not like very much. Um, this, this model really kind of put into play more of how I thought about the world of farming and the interaction of, of people with the land and with nature. And so it helped me kind of uh, put together a bit more of a sense of how, how to kind of bring this in a, in a somewhat of a regimented way, you know, a little bit more of a classical teaching approach. And I'll just show you one, one graphic here that I've used a lot um, that I, I'll, I'll just go through quickly here if I can get this. How's that look? Can you see that? No, it's you still your name. It. Yeah, it's still your name, Willie. No. Oh. Well, 
I'm I'm on screen share. I've got that graphic up. I don't know what to do about it. Is it um is um, it in this Word document? Oh, go ahead, Catherine. No. It's um, Willie, you'll need to share. So you're sharing your Word document right now. So you need to go in and share the graphic. Okay, so I need to stop share. I'm sorry, you guys. All right, let's see if share screen and then I got to go to the right thing, right? There we go. How about this? Looks good. All right. Um, yeah, as I was talking to Catherine and the guys before, uh, this is really the way for me to just kind of show off how great I am at art. And um, that's years ago, uh, we used to be standing up in front of rooms of people or in a barn or somewhere and having large sheets of paper and, and writing on them. And this is actually one of those versions. So the concept here, um, and I, that I'm gonna stem everything off of is, is the idea of, of being able to capture as much solar energy as possible. And I've, I was intrigued with hemp because I, it, from what I learned about it, it was, it was actually quite an incredible solar converter as I've heard these guys talk about already. And, and you guys have done a great job speaking about a lot of the, the real nitty gritty farming elements here. Um, one of the troubles that I think we have with, with farming that I'm concerned about a lot of the time is that they often don't capture enough solar energy to have any money left over at the end. And this graphic right here is just a just simplified, but it does help us stop it at a few places and do an assessment of the farm. And that's kind of my interest in general because I'll work with a hemp farmer or somebody that says they're a vegetable grower or a dairy farmer. And ultimately they have concerns or their, their business is not going as well as they'd like it to. And we need to ask imper pertinent questions about particular kind of stopping points along the way. And that first circle at the top there is, is solar conversion. Obviously that's photosynthesis primarily and it's, it's where the plants grow and it's how the field crops are doing and the pastures are growing and so on and so forth or the hemp. And then that energy that is taken in by the plants obviously is converted ultimately into something that we call a product. And it could be just as simple as a, a tomato. Um, it might end up being something like uh, meat um, or milk. And then that conversion, that energy that, that we'd like to think primarily came from the sun that moved into that product then needs to go to a market conversion where ultimately it turns into a revenue stream that pumps out some money at the end that we'd like to call solar dollars. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going to put out there that one of the advantages of farming versus uh, being an IBM or a GE is that we have a free energy source. We have quite a few kind of free things that we can take advantage of, but a lot of our farming has moved us into the mode where we're, we're overspending the value of the amount of solar energy that we capture so that we don't really have any money at the end. And obviously each one of these points is a place to kind of uh, do an assessment at the farm level and say, you know, is my solar conversion as optimal as it can be? Um, am I spending essentially more money and resources on trying to capture that conversion and, and why? Um, if, if that's, you know, as strong as it seems like it possibly can be, then we can move to the product conversion or the market conversion and ask those same questions. It's a way for us to assess this back. And I'm, I'm very convinced that um, most of our farms are still much weaker at the solar conversion than they should be. And with a bit more emphasis on how to create more solar conversion, I think we'd find ourselves in a mode where the product conversion and the market conversion would be at least a little bit uh, easier. There'd be more flow going into each one of those elements. So I guess, you know, just to kind of wrap up in a way here, I don't know what my time is, but I think uh, as, we're, okay, <laughs> as, as, thank you. as we're looking at, at hemp or any other, any other cropping system, um, 
you know, one of the things that excited me about hemp was the idea that being that it needed primarily to be um, produced under organic regimen and a lot of the people that were interested in it were really interested in the organic and also interested in soil health and having another, uh, another crop on the land that potentially could rotate with other crops. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to do things with this crop that are different than what we've done with crops in the past. And I think we take lessons from some of the really innovative vegetable growers out there, maybe, maybe vineyard growers who have brought in, you know, uh, multi-layer cropping, certainly been working hard on, on cover cropping, um, you know, diversity of more plant material, more of the time of the year, trying to have a better environment for the prey and predator environment. Um, you know, we, we, we like to um, replace um, inputs. And I saw this with organic a lot is that we'd, we'd go to organic and then say, well, what are we gonna use for this particular type of fertilizer now? Or what are we gonna use for this kind of pest control? And try to substitute with the same system, um, a, a different kind of product that was allowed for organic. And I think we have an opportunity here to really kind of rethink a bit more on, on how we approach the ability of the environment to help offset many of the issues that we spend a lot of money and time and energy on. So um, this graphic right here is really just a way for me to kind of make that conversation happen often with a farmer that you know there's these stopping points that we need to assess. And um, I really, I, I guess I'm, I'm very convinced that hemp as, as one example can be a way for us to kind of grow our capacity to um, do a better job, especially with the solar conversion and capture more of that solar energy, find the environmental uh, you know, issues uh, that, we, that we wanna work on within that. And I, and I suggest anybody you know, who's doing this, even if you've been doing it for a while, try something new every year, at least on some 10% of your land or with 10% of your resources. Try something that's, that's outside. You, know, you said you might try some sheep in your, in your, in your plot there for, for working on weeds. Um, do something that's gonna expand your knowledge, expand your experience and help you understand um, where maybe a, a weakness is or, or, or where, where you need to kind of go to um, facilitate building up a certain strength that you have. Great. I guess I'll quit there. Yeah, thanks Willie, that was great, thank you. All right, well now um, if folks, there are some questions in, in the Q&A box, so we'll get going on those and if we have um, if you have any more questions, please put them in the box. And so I'll try to direct these to the um, appropriate folks, but everybody feel free to, to chime in. Um, before we get too far into this, um, Dan, do you want to pick up on the smokable flower in New York, the legality of smokable flower? Would you be sure. able to address that? Yeah, so in the new CBD law that was uh, passed last year and then signed into law over the summer and the regulations were put out, um, I, I'm on the board of the New York Growers, um, New York Cannabis Growers and Prosperous Association. We were working very closely with the governor's office and the state assembly on the regulations. Uh, we were trying to fight tooth and nail against the prohibition of, uh, against flour, um, but the health department ultimately decided that that was the direction they were going to go because they don't want to encourage uh, smoking in any capacity. They did so without regard for the fact that, as Sam and Sai pointed out, that is probably the most highest um, grossing revenue part of the plant. And a lot of farmers, especially that grew this year and are planning to grow next year, were hoping to take advantage of the flower market. So. The regulations have not been certified yet. There is a number of uh, ongoing actions. Uh, one is there's a lawsuit that is uh, about to be filed against um, uh, the state uh, to show that that actually goes against the um, U.S. Farm Bill and, and what, the, what, what it's stated there in terms of flour and what can and can't be sold. And also the New York State Assembly is um, 
uh, about to pass a bill that actually um, uh, allows uh, for smokable flour, and we'll see what happens when that gets to the governor's desk. So it's not a done deal. There's a lot of things going on. Um, as, as you guys had said before, enforcement is definitely an issue. I know most people aren't really taking it down or not. So we sell pre-rolls. Um, we are you know, we're a Delaware incorporated company and we tend to just buy flour. And so we're not necessarily governed by the New York regulations. And some might find that they can get around the, the law that way if they want to do it that. Um, but um, I would say if you have an interest um, in that uh, industry, in that market, to make your voice known, um, please contact me, Dan at Eaton Hemp. Dot com and I could um, certainly give you the materials to uh, to kind of reach out to the right folks to just let them know that this is not something you want to see happen. Great. That is perfect. Thank you. Um, so Willie, this question is for you. Do yaks eat hemp readily? Uh, I've never seen a yak that wouldn't it, but I guess I can't say that I've ever seen a yak that would either, so I don't know, and I know who asked that question. <laughs> well, we'll be talking to him later on. <laughs> okay, great. I'm sure it's an inside joke, so I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, so what about organic cold-pressed hemp seed oil? Um, Dan, I think that question is for you as well. Sure. What is the, I guess, what, what does, uh, I think maybe, you know, is it something that you've looked at? Um, sure. we did have peep somebody talking about that earlier. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, it's a great product. I mean, again, like I said, it's the only uh, vegan alternative to fish oil because the omega threes and sixes, um, it has a low smoke point, so it's not a good cooking oil, but it is a good um, you know, dipping oil or topping oil or things like that. Um, and it is just something that if you took every day incorporated into your diet and replaced it with fish oil or as a replacement for fish oil, I think that would do well. Um, you know, I don't know if the market's fully fleshed out. We do use hemp seed oil, organic hemp seed oil as a carrier for our CBD, which is a, a bit of a differentiator in the market as most CBD companies use MCT or coconut oil. So Again, our commitment to the whole plant, um, we make sure that we try and use uh, hemp seed oil as the uh, as the carrier there. Um, but um, you know, all, all of these uh, things that you can do with hemp seed, flour, grain, um, you know, they all they all still have need need the market to be fleshed out, and they need people to really be entrepreneurial about it and kind of educate the consumer base because. Um, the only way hemp becomes a commodity is when you're, you know, flying over Nebraska and you're seeing tens of thousands of acres planted um, as a uh, as a rotational crop with corn and, and kind of an alternative to traditional monocropping. I think that's when you'll know that hemp has really um, hit the big time. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I, I guess this is for anybody. Is um, hemp a, a problem the following year as a volunteer? Um, so if you're growing another crop, you know, you're in rotation, is hemp kind of rearing its ugly head as a, a weed? Um, are we seeing it, you know, as kind of a, a nuisance out there yet? Um, yeah, I, for our angle, it's a problem if you're trying to grow CBD flower, because some of those volunteer plants could be males and they could potentially fertilize your crop. Um, so when we switched from doing grain to uh, CBD, we really uh, had to go over that field, you know, till it, mow it, inspect it. Um, because again, even one male plant can ruin thousands of plants. Uh, so in terms of flower production, it is an issue that you should be mindful of. Yeah, yeah we see volunteers every year. Um, it's kind of crazy. The volunteers end up growing to be like 12, 14 feet tall because yeah, <laughs> they've had nothing to do but grow all year. So, but yeah. that, I think that's a great point. Yeah. For certain cross pollination with CBD. And I don't know if you guys have touched on that, but it is, it is a huge concern and, um, you know, there are ways around it, but it's an issue. Yeah. I mean, we've actually, um, 
seen it as an issue in even in our test plots. I had volunteer um, hemp in our barley this year, which I didn't even really, I couldn't see it out there. It didn't grow all that tall. It was really dry um, until we were harvesting the barley. And then I could see that um, it, was, it had pollen coming off of it. And yeah. some of our other plots were, were right near it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, crap. So yeah, it's definitely something, something uh, that we're gonna have to deal with more and more as the acreage expands, like Dan, you were saying. So we have one, one last question, and we're right, uh, we're almost right at one o'clock. So it'll be a perfect ending. Um, and again, this is for anybody. What um, are your thoughts on irrigation drip lines versus nat you know, nature um, and water guns? And this is, you know, what's what's kind of best for growing hemp for CBD in particular? Um, we use we use a drip irrigation system. Um, we've found it, it's never going to be a uh, it's never going to be a, a a substitute for natural rainfall. Um, but it is really nice if you can supplement like you know each. Uh, supplement the plants with water we found that if like you get a drought especially in like as they're finishing up flowering like the buds just won't fill out as nice you won't have the nice trichomes the cannabinoids won't won't climb as high um don't put your drip line directly underneath the plants uh that'll be a huge issue the root the root ball will choke it will choke them out and you'll spend a lot of time um, you know, testing the ends of the lines and fixing them, uh, try to offset it a little bit. But, um, I'd say if you're going to do like, we're growing this next year, we're growing 30 acres. We're growing like 13,000 plants over 30 acres. And we'll, we'll definitely have a, a temporary holding pond and a big drip irrigation system. Great. Any other, um, comments from folks? No, Dan had mentioned, uh, Hemp is pretty drought tolerant, but it's not, um, you know, it needs water. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, a lot of crops are drought tolerant, but if you want to maximize yield. Yeah. yeah and those first two weeks, like I said, are, are key. So you okay. want to have some rainfall, but not a lot. And so really that would be my judge when I look at when to plant. It's more weather rather than time. Great. Oh, wow. wow, everyone. This was fabulous. Go ahead, Willie. Sorry. I just... I just think I'll, I'll just mention too that the, the, the drip line thing, there's a couple things I noticed um, with the 800 acres that I worked with in 2019 in particular. And, and one was that in some fields where the, where the plant growth was tremendously large, I felt like the, uh, the drip line, the side, and it was all under plastic and the side uh, where the drip line was, the soil actually was not, as strong or the, uh, the root systems weren't as strong and they were, they were tending to blow over opposite, opposite direction of the, where the drip line was, seemed to cause some kind of weakness anyway and, and how well the root structured in there. And these were huge plants. Um, and again, it wasn't on all eight, 800 acres I worked with, but that was one thing. The other thing I'd say about drip irrigation is that um, it's going to the root um, and it, it does give you an opportunity to do a little bit of feeding of some kind, um, amending uh, very specifically with either certain nutrients or microbials or, um, you know, whatever. So it, it does give you some opportunity to kind of do some maximizing. Um, I'm, I'm concerned, though, that, that, that it can also be overused, both the fertilizer and the water. Yeah. Yeah, we agree with that. Yeah, I, I've also seen that a lot um, where people are over irrigating. And um, yeah, I mean, we do get natural rainfall, but not always when we want it. And so having that irrigation can be really great to supplement for sure when we need it, but also know that um, we should be subtracting off the amount of precipitation that we get each week as well as what's held in the soil so that you're not overwatering, which can be lots of, cause lots of other issues. Yeah. Well, this was awesome. Thank you so much, um, 
everybody, Dan, Willie, Sai, and Sam, this is really great. Thanks for sharing your time and knowledge. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, definitely look forward to continuing working with all of you.